So welcome. Uh, great to see you all here. Um, uh, this is uh, this uh, class. What we're going to do is two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, Michael is going to give a lecture that he has prepared, which uh, I'm actually looking forward to. I've actually gotten some preview of it, and I actually brought my cards to take notes because uh, I'm also going to have the privilege of uh, leading the questions. We have uh, selected questions from the things that you guys have submitted already, and I have those on index cards in addition to my own, and I'll interweave them. I've actually sent them all to Michael in the you know, just-in-time basis about 45 minutes ago, so he's now computing like, oh, those are the questions that are going to come after the lecture. Uh, and so as a quick introduction to Michael, um, uh, Michael is a, uh, 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 teaches at the D School. He actually teaches entrepreneurship. He runs a very successful uh, early stage venture capital practice uh, called Harrison Metal. The way that Michael and I met is I tried, I think, two or three times to recruit him to LinkedIn, to which he told me no each time. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that maybe more in the Q&A. Uh, but he is an excellent investor, an excellent uh, product guy, and an excellent scale executive. Uh, and so uh, we, we asked him to come and uh, share some of his wisdom with us. That's thank, it. Thank you for the invitation. So <laughs> this is going to be a little strange, but uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, come with me back in time. And I want to talk to you about a hero of capitalism who's long dead, thus the uh, footnote uh, from beyond the grave. Um, and poor John Lilly is stuck flipping my slides. Um, <laughs> We're fixing that for the next class. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, so let's dive into heroes of capitalism. The first thing that I want to give you context for, and believe me, this all does tie right back to startups and entrepreneurship, I promise. The first thing I want to give you is a thousand years of context. I want to give you a thousand years of reasons why what we're talking about in this room matters. Uh, if you can see this and read the title, just digest it for a second, and then maybe somebody give us a guided tour of this, this slide, this exhibit. What is this? of GDP per capita, right? So it's the economic output of every person on Earth from the year 1000 to the year 2000. I wish I had the brain power to come up with this data set, but I don't. But I did steal it from a person named Jay Bradford DeLong who teaches economics at Berkeley. And Professor DeLong did, his, actual, his study, his paper was actually estimating world GDP 1 million BC uh, to the present. I cut the million part off, the million to 1,000 part, because it's, the answer is it's really low. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and this, this, this tells the story well enough for me. So uh, therefore, it works for you too. <laughs> so real GDP per capita, constant dollars, over time, over a thousand year span, on a, on a, log, on a semi-log scale. So what we're able to do here is to see an incredible, whoops, what we're able to do here is to see an incredible change in the circumstances of being human on Earth. Give me your thoughts about this curve. When you look at it, what are some of the, the features that jump out at you, some of the landmarks that really stand out to you? It went down for a while. Yeah, yeah uh, round about the 13th century. Any guesses what that is? Plague. The plague, yeah, yeah. In case you ever do build a time machine, please do not put the settings uh, to that because you'll have a one in three chance of not coming home. Uh, uh, the population drop was precipitous, particularly in Europe. And so the, the, the productivity, as really what GDP per capita is, is productivity, collapsed. Now, if we go forward in time, what else do you notice about this curve? Industrial revolution, and where do you see that beginning? Yeah, this inflection point, kind of hard to miss, right? It's the, it's the most obvious feature of this, this uh, chart, with the exception of the incredible amount of flatness over the preceding 700 years. So the flatness with the painful, extra painful dip, really bad. Have you ever lived through a low growth situation? Now try doing that for uh, 30 generations. That would suck. Um, this inflection point, Industrial Revolution, anybody uh, remember from maybe uh, other history courses you've taken or just your own readings? Like, what were some of the big things that happened to make that inflection point possible? So, I, I heard that it's uh, correlated really nicely with the introduction of coffee shops. Um, really? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so in, uh, 
ideas have been set to the advantage of the stuff that people basically describe that when people started meeting and discussing ideas in coffee shops, and you can correlate this graph with the rise of, of coffee shops, not Starbucks, that one better, but, uh, but people meeting and discussing ideas in different disciplines. That's fascinating, but I buy it. Uh, the exchange of ideas, certainly something changed here with respect to, you could think about the density of population in some of those cities, the mobility of people to be able to spend time with one another, mostly because they weren't in the fields trying to come up with their next meal, right? They had some more free time to exchange ideas. Um, yeah, what else do you think happened here? Insurance. So like coffee shops, right? Like Lloyd's of London, the first insurance company, was founded in a coffee shop run by a guy named Lloyd in London near the docks. Okay. So once people were able to have insurance for business ventures, they could go in and, you know, take more risks. And therefore, when you, it's risk for work, right? So you can have a much greater potential income if you do take risks and you can insure against it. Okay, so, so in that sense, you might actually go back to Adam Smith and say that the division of labor there started to get more granular. There were specialists in provision of coffee, the provision of insurance. There might have been specialists in the, in the invention of new technologies. Uh, I want to read to you a America. <laughs> So that falls into the bucket of like heavily loaded one line uh, class participation. So give me the highlights of what you mean by America. 1776, America was founded. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the spirit that made America great. Is the, will, is the willingness in your first year of undergraduate, right? You're a freshman. To. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. This, this is the courage that we depend on uh, to, fuel, uh, to fuel that curve. I want to read to you a paragraph. We'll come back to this, I promise. I'm not, uh, I'm not blowing you off, but I need to think a little bit about how to respond to you, so I'm going to stall by reading Schumpeter. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter wrote this book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, and he wrote it in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. And um, the paragraph that I want to read to you, I think, is really special. Um, he, you, you'll probably recognize some of these terms uh, when we get to them. This is Schumpeter writing about capitalism, writing about this. The opening up of new markets, foreign or domestic, and the organizational development from the craft shop and factory to such concerns as U.S. Steel illustrate the same process of industrial mutation, if I may use a biological term, that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating a new one. This process of creative destruction, capital C, capital D, is the essential fact of capitalism. Schumpeter believed this was due to entrepreneurship. It was due to people you never heard of starting businesses you couldn't quite believe were real, completely unsettling the economic output model for the economy. A couple other things happened at this time, too. One was um, plentiful sources of cheap energy became available in the form of coal, uh, steam, uh, eventually oil, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, so that the scale of the inventions, the inventions that these entrepreneurs came up with, the scale could be many, many times greater than anything that had seen, been seen before. Humans didn't suddenly become a creative species in the late 1700s. They just started to get bigger levers and gears to turn the machines they built with. So power was a huge part of this. Um, the revolution in, in technical innovation, in, in transportation like the railroads, in mechanization like spinning cotton, all of those things played a huge role in that inflection point. The other person, John, if you could flip ahead, the, thank you. The other person that's really important to know about is this person, Al Chandler. Al Chandler founded the discipline of business history at the Harvard Business School. And before he retired and then sadly passed away, I had a chance to spend a lot of time with him and his colleagues at Harvard. Chandler's view was, Schumpeter is right. Entrepreneurs play an incredibly central role in the process of of, of industrial capitalism, in the growth of output, in the wealth of humanity. But managers play an equally important role in amplifying the genius of those creative founders. And so um, Chandler's whole view was that the managerial revolution, which, uh, which scaled with these companies, remember the entrepreneurs came up with the technology, 
the, the company scaled because of energy sources. They had to be managed at a scale that was unlike anything ever seen before in history. And so Chandler says that this invention of managerial capitalism was a fundamentally new invention that came with industrialization. So what do we have? We have this painfully flat period of about seven or 800 years. We have this rapid change in direction uh, of output per person on the planet Earth. By the way, totally unequally shared. Um, correlates beautifully with population growth, um, the collapse in infant mortality, the widespread availability of education, medicine, et cetera, the increase in uh, the dirtiness of our air, some would argue the temperature of the planet. Um, this, is, this is a mix of things here happening. But all of the terrible things that came before it, now we finally have an engine that can pay the bill to fix those things that are horrifying about life on Earth. Slavery, uh, war for food, uh, all of these things were commonplace in this period. They were invented long before capitalism. Capitalism finally gave us an engine to pay the bill to get rid of these things. So this is the, this is the context, the thousand year context that I wanna have in our mind when we talk about entrepreneurship. Yeah? Uh, I was just saying also that colonial empires at the beginning of the of the drop, have to do with, you know, let's say, India, the US, also. Well, if I understand the point correctly, yes, the, the ability of the colonial powers to distribute technology, ways of work, legal structures, not by choice, but by force, was a huge driver of economic growth in this period. But what's interesting about industrialization in each of the countries where it happened, first in Britain, then the United States, and now in places like China and India in the last half century, it always comes with an expansion of political freedom. It always comes with an expansion of um, personal freedom. It always comes with the writing of terrible hundred year, many hundred year, many centuries old injustices. And we're gonna come back to that topic in a second. Go ahead. The other thing to note that connects you and what you're talking about in this room to the really important stuff in human history, the money that comes to Silicon Valley to fund these startups, to fund entrepreneurship, to fund the creative destruction of today. It doesn't come from the uh, wealthy fat cats. It come, it, some of it does, but a lot of it, most of it comes from research institutions, universities, museums, foundations, hospitals, the guardians of civilization. So this cycle of creative destruction that drives economic productivity, that spins off wealth, that comes back and fuels institutions, that is something to be very, very aware of. This cycle is all linked, okay? So, no pressure, but it's your turn to drive this train. We've got to understand the Schumpeterian view of entrepreneurs as the engine of creative destruction. We've got to embrace the role of managerial capitalism to scale and amplify the genius of those founders. And we've got to use the proceeds of whatever we create to make that situation, uh, make our situation better, to eliminate those things that are terrible about being on Earth that have been around for a long time. Poverty, uh, injustice, ignorance, sickness, etc. Okay, so no pressure, but civilization depends on you. Okay, there are three really fascinating parts of this curve. Now, I've zoomed in here just to reorient. Same curve, zoomed in on the period 1800 to 2000. And there's three separate periods in that window that are really interesting. The first is the mechanization of manufactured cotton. The second is the transportation revolution, characterized mainly by the railroads, um, uh, the railroads uh, of, of, of uh, Western Europe and the United States, and third, the technology revolution of Silicon Valley and the modern age that we know so well. We're gonna zoom in kind of right about here. Early on, oh, no, we're not gonna do Slater's Mill today, although we could, we're gonna do the railroads. Sorry, I, um, I left a Slater's Mill slide in there. The, um, the thing to know about the railroads is that they were startups once. They were startups once. This is a, 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 um, a locomotive that was manufactured in 1830 in the UK. And at one time, 
This was a startup very much like the startups that you know and love of today in Silicon Valley. And the startups were run by people like this. This is Daniel McCallum, and he's, he's the hero of capitalism who's going to speak to us from beyond the grave today. This is him in later life, obviously, but when he started out, he came to America in uh, 1822. He was born in Scotland. Uh, his family moved to upstate New York when he was just seven years old. He came to upstate New York from Scotland. He looked at what his father did for a living. His dad was a tailor, and he decided... The tailoring thing is not so much for me. So he started to think about what else he could do. Very young, very young boy, 12, 13 years old, began to work with wood. He taught himself how to, uh, to build practically anything with wood. He ended up uh, creating uh, something called the McCallum uh, Arched Truss Bridge, which got him a patent. Um, he became something of a magician with woodworking and with bridge making. So self-taught woodworker, became self-taught architect, became patented architect, was hired by the New York and Erie Railroad to be the, be the bridge apprentice in upstate New York. He was then promoted, this is all the span of a couple years in between each of these milestones, he was then promoted to head of bridges, to superintendent of bridges, pardon me, uh, for the entire line, then was given a general manager promotion to the head of the Susquehanna branch of the railroad, and then finally became the CEO of the entire railroad uh, when he was about 43 years old. So this was, a, this was somebody who was, if you just looked at his career, you would say, this is about as entrepreneurial as it gets. Son of immigrants, decided he had no uh, future prospects in the tailoring business, decided to go into something he loved, wood, working with wood, continued to get promoted and create a career for himself out of thin air found himself inside a company that had once been a startup that he knew, and what, knew well and loved as a local, um, a local member of the team in upstate New York, but then got promoted to be the head of the whole thing. And let me give you a sense of the scope of the whole thing. Uh, this is his bridge, by the way. The nice thing about this bridge is um, it lasted a lot longer than typical bridge designs, and it required substantially less maintenance. And so you can imagine why in the capital-constrained early days of railroads, that would be a really good thing for the railroads to have. So this was his claim to fame. He built uh, many of these bridges throughout the Northeast. This is the scope of his operation. He started out as a maybe third or fourth rung employee in upstate New York on one of those tiny red lines, and he ended up running this whole thing. So why does this matter? I thought we were talking about startups, not big, huge enterprises. It matters because McCallum in 1855 wrote a beautiful letter to his boss. And the letter he wrote to his boss, you can have it, it's online. Um, it's, one of the earliest, it's one of the earliest writings that survive of anybody saying, here's what I think about general management. Here's why it matters what we do as general managers. And in this document, he writes about the incredible... Um, the, the relative ease and fun and, and joy he got working on a small railroad of 50 miles long in, in upstate New York and compared it to the toil and suffering and awfulness of trying to run a road 10 times or 100 times longer. And so McCallum wrote this letter to his bosses to say, we got to rethink how we do this because we've lost, essentially, he says it in a more... Uh, 19th century, hard to understand way, uh, but he says, we've lost what made it easy and fun running a small company because now we're trying to run this big behemoth. Does that make sense? And this goes very far west. I mean, this is all the way into Kansas territory, 18, 1850s. So you get the idea. Okay, so I will save you, you should go read this letter, but I will save you all of the pain and suffering of reading it if you don't want to and tell you what he says. He says, the joy of running that 50-mile road was because I could see people with my own eyes. I could talk to them with my own voice. I could get the group of people to work on the right stuff at the right time. I could give those people responsibility because I knew who they were, right? I had a personal connection to them. I was also able to make sure the job was getting done day in, day out because I was putting my own eyes on the problem. And in that 50-mile road, in the startup railroad, I knew how things were going because I could see the trains moving or not. I could see the freight coming on going or not. It was all very visible to me. 
And also, in the 50-mile road, we had a relationship with each other, we had respect for each other, and we talked to each other like human beings. In the 500-mile road, or the 5,000-mile road, all of this went away. And so McCallum was struggling to say, how do I bring back what I loved about the small road to the big road? And these are the five questions that he asked his boss. He, of course, had an answer for each one of these. For example, uh, how do you uh, make sure the job gets done? His answer was, you get on the frickin' telegraph, and every hour you tell me how it's going in Nebraska. And you tell me in this format so that my clerk can write it on the board, and I can stand in New York City, and I can see how it's going out in the hinterlands. And every hour on the hour, you send this, this formatted update back and forth using Telegraph, and that's how I replicate the visibility I had at the small company level to the big company level. Does this make sense? Any, any observations about this list? That surpri anything surprise you about McCallum's list of key questions for managers or about his story in general? Yeah. Isn't it crazy? The first time I read this, which was about 25 years ago in grad school, I really thought, this is odd that somebody who, remember, apprenticed as a, a, a woodworker, no formal training, dropped, you know, didn't finish, didn't go beyond, educationally go beyond grade school. There's no such thing as business school. There's no role models. He had no apprenticeship. He was uh, promoted every 24-ish months into higher and higher levels of responsibility with no clue what he was doing. He basically admits as much in this letter. These questions are really useful today. There are no financial constraints or goals in there. Yeah, it is. Uh, it does kind of take for granted the financial viability of the business, which, by the way, was not a good thing to take for granted because about two or three years after he wrote this letter, the railroad failed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, you know, we uh, honor that. Uh, <laughs> I should say more importantly than all that stuff, you saw it, can you flip back to the picture of him? Uh, you see what uniform he's wearing. Uh, he, he became the master of railroads for the Union Army, thank God, uh, right? Because if he had been the Confederates, we wouldn't be talking about Daniel McCallum. Uh, he was on the Union side. He played a huge important role in commandeering the supplies to feed General Sherman's attack on Atlanta. So uh, hero of the Civil War as well as hero of capitalism. Uh, flipping, yeah, th these five questions, no financial, no financial milestones or, or a preoccupation with finances, still pretty relevant today. Anything else jump out at you? Yeah. It appears pretty enlightened for a guy that's, I guess, working with quite menial workers yeah. in a position of authority. It's concerned with respect for others and relationships. Yeah. The fact that this is on the list, now the way he says it is uh, something to the effect of uh, execute all of the above so as not to, not to um, create embarrassment for the management, the managers. Um, uh, that, that idea of respect was really totally surprising and very unique. I think, for the times, yeah. Not only how applicable they are, but how unsolved they still are. <laughs> and he wrote this 170 years ago. I find it a great relief that uh, I'm not the only one who doesn't know how to do any of these things uh, or who, who, who tries to figure out ways to do it. This has been going on a long time. This has all happened before. Still unresolved. Uh, I think I, there was a, somebody had a hand over here. No? Anything else before we keep going on? Okay, so uh, you know, just to put this in context, what, what was McCallum doing? He was participating in his own small way right about here, where the shape of this curve was by no means a foregone conclusion. In fact, they didn't even know that it was going this way. They sort of felt like something was different, but they didn't know it was going this way. They certainly didn't know the amount of wealth that they were part of creating, and they certainly didn't know that what McCallum was doing in a weird way, was directly tied to that injustice stuff that I talked to you about before. This is a book called Things As They Are in America. A British guy named William Chambers came to America in the late 1840s, early 1850s, and he wrote a diary of what he observed in the then very young country, pre-Civil War. So one of the stops he made was to see the slave auctions in, <coughs> in Virginia. And I'm going to read to you, this was happening a few hundred miles to the south of where McCallum was struggling with these lofty ideas of 
geez, how do we get people to work together? And how do we make sure that the work gets done? And how do we make sure that the right amount of responsibility is conferred, uh, conferred on people? All those general management uh, challenges that he laid out in his letter about the railroad, a couple hundred miles to the south. This is Chambers writing about his visit uh, to Richmond. Here, according to the announcement on the paper, stuck to the flag, there were to be sold <clears throat> a woman and three children, a young woman, three men, a middle-aged woman, and a little boy. Already a crowd had met, composed, I should think, of persons mostly from the cotton plantations of the South. He goes on to describe the situations, the situation in the room where the auction was being held. And he, and he, and he writes, while intending purchases were proceeding with personal examinations of the several lots, what he means by that is that the people who came to buy the other human beings was poking and prodding them and looking in their mouth and checking their hands to understand how much they should pay for those people. I took the liberty of putting a few questions to the mother of the children. The following was our conversation. Are you married woman? Yes, sir. How many children have you had? Seven. Where is your husband? In Madison County. When did you part from him? On Wednesday, two days ago. Were you sorry to part from him? Yes, sir, she replied with a deep sigh. My heart almost abroke. Why is your master selling you? I don't know. He wants money to buy some land. I suppose he sells me for that. This cures that. That's why what you're doing matters. This would never have happened without people like McCallum, and the wealth that was created from that Industrial Revolution paid for the destruction of this disgusting industry. So that's why it matters. Oh, that's it. So, no pressure, but civilization depends on you. And now I'd be happy to have a chat. So in reading McCallum's letter, did you get a sense that he was a micromanager? Oh, terrible. Yeah. Terrible. He had um, practices not only for those telegraph rules that I mentioned before, excruciating detail about how the, telegraphs, the telegrams were to be addressed, this, the timetable on which they were supposed to happen, how you would decide to break a tie between two trains on the same track. It was an excruciatingly detailed uh, uh, operating manual. Yeah. So it might be somewhat given the education level, but it was like, the, send me a telegram every hour. I could imagine a startup in Silicon Valley saying, report your status every hour. <laughs> right? It wouldn't be a great talent retention strategy. No, he was flailing around for any tool he could get his hands on to try to recreate the intimacy of managing a small business on a large one. And of course, he failed completely. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, and the financial one was a very good question. Dude. Yes. <laughs> it was kind of the question of, well, there's other things that go into doing this. Although, by the way, I didn't, before the lecture, I didn't know about McCallum, and he actually may be the very first example of a systematic attack on the scale-up problem. Mm. So in the book we're working on, we actually may, we're gonna go read the letter and we're gonna oh, see yeah. if we're gonna, we're gonna include it, so it's yeah. awesome. Um, so when you look at the curve, one part of that curve is obviously capitalism. Yes. But another part of it is also uh, invention of technology. Mm -hmm. And those two are actually, in fact, obviously somewhat correlated, mm -hmm. although how deeply is kind of a little bit unclear. Mm -hmm. When you think about this exponential growth in value, how much do you attribute to the, to the uh, incentive system that essentially capitalism does to, 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 to create a decentralized system of incentives, and how much to technology invention, and how do you look at that curve? I think, they're, I think of them as mutually reinforcing, and if you took one away, the other would collapse. Um, and, because, and we know that because we accidentally ran an experiment for 800 years as a planet uh, where we had, in, you know, smart, lots of smart people running around inventing new ways to do things. You could look at banking in Florence or uh, printing in, in England, but uh, these became very small enterprises. They, they sort of topped out at the like 20, 30 people range, and of course the capital that accumulated around those businesses was tiny. What really unleashed it, in my view, was the, 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 um, the disconnection of the good ideas from the money, from the management. So when you, had the, when, you had, when you had to have one person who happened to have money, happened to have great ideas, and happened to have um, managerial ambitions, that's a small set of people. 
when you suddenly say, ah, the money people can be different than the inventor, and the inventor can yet be different than the general manager, that allows a, you know, a multitude of connections that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And when you uh, did this kind of learning, did you also include kind of the, the weird paradox that venture capital was essentially invented post-World War II? So it's actually very late in that curve. It is very late in that curve, and I think you, what you have to look at is the substitutes for venture capital were essentially rich families yep. um, and rich institutions. And you can go back to Slater's Mill, uh, the people who put up the capital for Slater's Mill. Oh, that's why I had that damn slide in there. <laughs> uh, the people who put up the capital for Slater's Mill were the Brown family of Providence, the people who, who named, who, after whom Brown University was named. Um, uh, this was a family that made their fortune in the slave trade and then in the textile business, um, and then uh, had no clue how to mechanize their, 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 their spinning operations. Slater was the embodiment of somebody who had the technical skill and inventiveness, ideas mostly which he stole uh, from, from the UK, um, and they were able to pair together in a way that wouldn't have been possible previously. In prior generations, the, the Brown family would have had to have the incredible good fortune of understanding the technology and having the money. Now all they had to do was be rich, and they were good at that. And, and also, by the way, the history of venture capital, actually it started, it's all moved in, in many of the elite funds to the institutions you're mm -hmm, mentioning, mm -hmm. your own, Greylock, et cetera. But actually, the starting of them was actually also wealthy families. Yes. By the way, it was a similar kind of thing that was kind of an interesting Absolutely. Uh, recapitulation of history. Yep. All right, so uh, now shifting um, somewhat, you know, we're beginning to hone into some of the scale up stuff. But at the very broad, so the, it's kind of a call to arms mm -hmm. for capitalism, it's a call to arms for entrepreneurship, it's a call to arms for creative destruction. When should someone, we have a bunch of students here, when should they consider doing a startup? And when should they not consider doing a startup? And how is some of the way to think about that? Well, one of the um, one of the things I've noticed over the last about eight years that I've been exclusively focused on early stage ventures is that they kind of can't keep it inside them. It kind of bursts out, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. The founder has this this uh, this. Um, uh, explosion that they can't keep inside anymore, and they they irrationally allocate time and uh, resources to this idea because they can't stop thinking about it. I think that's a prerequisite if you're gonna. So if you if you smell that about yourself, if you feel like you can't stop thinking or working on an idea, if you find that you're working on an idea and the the hands of the clock move and you never even noticed that the sun went down and you missed two meals, that's a really good sign that you have an idea you have to get out of your system. Um, the other uh, characteristics, I think, of the, the folks that, that when, when, they, when they know they're ready is um, that they are accidentally, accidentally, not even trying to recruit other people, but accidentally getting their friends fired up too. And so the friends come and start saying like, hey, remember that thing you told me about last week? I was thinking about it a little bit more. That's the mark. I'm not like a mystical person, but I kind of think the market talks to you. Uh, that's the market talking to you. That's the market saying, tell me more, I'm pulling on you for more insight. If you have those circumstances going on, those are good indicators that it's time to do something about it. And, and what are the indicators that you would use for checking the idea? Because obviously you could have those indicators. You could be crazy about them. Yes. You could you know, be jumping off a cliff with no ability to assemble an airplane on the way down. Right. What, what, what are the cross checks that you think that people should do? One really good one is to give uh, a chunk of time in the schedule to devil's advocacy. And, and this was, a, t this was a, a, t a tactic that I learned uh, uh, from Michael Eisner at Disney. Uh, Michael, uh, I didn't work for him, but I worked for somebody who worked for him. And the whole idea there was every big good idea is going to be subjected to a devil's advocate case. And somebody, probably the smartest person he could find, is going to be in charge of trying to destroy your idea. And he or she isn't going to be held as like, you know, you, they're not going to be considered to be, you know, uh, out of bounds for trying to destroy your idea. It was their job to try to destroy your idea. And that, that technique of saying, okay, you, please spend the next two days finding everything wrong with this. And then you have full permission to be the biggest asshole you ever met uh, trying to torpedo this idea. Uh, if you can find some people in your life who can play that role, that's a huge positive as a founder. I think the other technique that I like um, to do with, with founders is um, let's do a pre-mortem. Let's admit now that we failed and let's forecast what it is that would have gone wrong to cause our death. 
And if we can do that openly and honestly and make a list of what those deadly risks are facing us in our venture, we may decide to bail, we may decide to keep going, but we can't keep going without building shock absorbers for those risks. Yep. Love the two ideas. The, the version of the first one I do is when you're talk, you should talk to every smart person you know mm. and you should specifically ask them what's wrong on the idea. Mm -hmm. Because the problem when you're talking to them, like I come to my friend Michael and I say, what do you think of my new idea? You're like, oh, we'll read once reassurance. So, oh, yeah. it's great. Yeah, you know, yeah, hey, yeah. you should do that. Yep. That's terrible. That's, un that's actually even being negative value, not right. positive. Like, what, what, what's broken? Yep. Um, and I think I already called John out on telling me that LinkedIn was a total, totally bad idea. But. Yeah, but I've also told you, you maybe your bad ideas are bad. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> yes, that's a very good point. Um, what role do you people think need that? By the way, yes. people need that permission from you yes. as a founder. Yep. So you, for you to give them permission to say, I want you to be negative now. You don't even have, I don't even care if you believe it, but yep. give me your best shot. Yep. That social permission is, especially in an area that's so happy smiles and uh, rainbows, uh, <laughs> as, as uh, I was gonna say Silicon Valley, but you know, Stanford's that way too, yep. Yep. Uh, in a good way. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, let's have a little bit yep. of shock absorber against yep. the rainbows. And actually, specifically, part of the thing that John's feedback was very good on is that you can't build to enough critical mass, and so, that helped confirm the strategic thing was the very first thing at LinkedIn was to build a critical mass. Yep. Because when you get to good feedback, that isn't necessarily die, but that's the, ooh, this is the mine. Make, make it past this mine. Because you know, smart people going, this is the mine, you're like, mm -hmm. pay attention to that. Make sure you understand it. And that became the very top list thing that Alan and I and a bunch of other people were working on on a daily basis. The last thing in terms of founding a startup, or at least this part of it, what role do you think considering competition should be Mm. on whether or not you have a good idea or not. A lot of times the founders who, um, who, who, who pause on the issue of competition, they pause for the wrong reasons and they say things like, well, isn't, isn't big company XYZ going to do something just like this? Um, that's totally irrelevant. Uh, that's totally irrelevant. Uh, the, 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 the perfectly competitive product that promises what your product promises is almost never the actual competition. The competition is almost always the substitute for buying your thing is doing nothing or hacking their solution in their daily life, the user I'm talking about. And so I think if you're, if you're a friend of a founder or a founder yourself, steer the conversation more like, wait a minute, I'm not, shouldn't we be worried about big companies because um, they're slow and, and usually bad. Um, but, but I should be worried about what's uh, occupying my target user's attention today because that's really what I'm competing against. If you can answer that question, that's a lot more valuable than a competitive matrix that like a consulting firm would do. Yeah, actually frequently that one I, I say, discount the large co companies of competition unless like you're doing search and it's Google, <laughs> or unless you're doing yeah. you know, marketplace for used goods, yeah. and it's eBay, yeah. right? Because then you gotta, okay, no, no, you gotta understand what that's going, but discount it otherwise. But do think about other startups, right? Because sometimes like a startup may actually have a better approach in the market than mm -hmm. you, and then that actually is a relevant variable. It's not to say you should pattern your strategy on them, yep. but you sh they should be in the consideration set. Yep, yep. Um, so actually given that, one of the more funny things, given your presentation, what would be you, your advice for eBay now that you're, Years past, like how would you how would you reinvent? Well, you got to keep in mind I've been gone longer than I was ever there, yep. so been gone almost ten years. Um, but I do, of course, watch it. Uh, um, my advice is do more of what they've been doing, which is you know this unbundling of PayPal was I think the right thing. Mm. I think it was the right thing for shareholders. I think it was the right thing for the employees and the users mm -hmm. to to create more of a competitive market for the ideas. One of the nice things about that the combination of lots of complementary assets is you can do command and control economy inside. You can allocate capital by the decision of the CEO, and what what happens over time is his or her judgment is is fallible. And the market is actually a much better allocator of capital than one CEO or one investment committee inside a large company. Um, I, like, I like the unbundling. I would encourage them to think about doing more of it. I certainly would also um, uh, uh, think about the, uh, the amount of people that work there. Um, it sure feels like a lot. Um, and I'm not advocating for layoffs, although I guess maybe I just did. Uh, but uh, anyway. You're, you're advocating for asking the question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually, uh, funny, I actually don't know your view on this. 
Um, some of the leading edge Silicon Valley people think that you should organize internal companies based on markets mm -hmm. versus command and control. Mm -hmm. Do you have that point of view? If so, why? If not, why not? I do, particularly with respect to product development resources. And I, I, I tried, at the, you know, the handful of times where I've actually had management responsibility for a product process, uh, you know, allocating uh, software and hardware development time, which is the scarcest, much more scarce than capital, uh, to particular projects, tried to create a competitive market internal to the firm so that there was vigorous and, in some cases, maybe even negative productivity. But the comp competition for resources was very intense, and, and, and the internal mechanisms for drawing the line were driven by the economic value of the idea rather than the whim of a particular senior executive. But how did you make the decisioning happening? Because the decisioning, is it voting? Is it, well, like, what, what was the proxy for the market? Net present value. Uh, we would do but that's models, right? And it is. Right. It is. So and then, you have to have faith that people are not padding the models. And yeah. you have to have devil's advocates tear apart the models. And yeah. it becomes quite a bit of overhead. But if, if people are held accountable to economic uh, valuation of their ideas, um, over time, you can start to get a pattern. You can recognize a pattern of whether people are good predictors of their own mm -hmm. economic value of their ideas, and then allocate the resources on the basis of the most, the highest NPV projects uh, on the list. The downside to this is, of course, that you feed the beast, the mothership business, because mm -hmm. the NPV, the net present value of assigning more resources to the highly profitable, already huge business, is is unbeatable really in an internal market and that's why these big companies end up being slaves to their core business and they can't beat you they can't beat you on innovation or speed uh, and uh, would you recommend that a startup implement a marketplace <laughs> mechanism from the beginning yes or no yes but with a different pricing model I don't think startups should have to go through the um, the rigorous pricing and valuation analysis that a large company should. I think that ultimately the founder has to be the guardian and the editor in chief of that product roadmap. And she or he has to say, here's where we're drawing the line and here's why. Everybody can submit an idea, everybody can make their case, and I'm gonna to listen to everything, but it's a benevolent dictatorship on the product side. Interestingly, I think I disagree with you there because I actually think that the frequent thing that characterizes the startup phase is we are all casting our lot in this one direction. Actually, yeah. in fact, having somebody who is an autocrat or a small number of people who are autocrats and doing that. Yeah. For the efficiency of focus on doing that is actually, in fact, a key part of the success. Yeah. But I do think it's interesting that as you get to the higher levels of the order of magnitude scale, there's a fork in the road that, that happens there that is actually super interesting. Who do you think is the most successful company that implements a marketplace internal mechanism for this? Hmm. I've been I've been very impressed with how uh, Airbnb allocates resources for product development, and I say that because I think they're I think and this is an outsider's point of view. Mm -hmm. I don't have any special inside knowledge, but um, the people I know who work there often talk about like the things they need to invest in today for how the user experience needs to be nine, twelve, twenty-four months from now, and so I think they have they have a a, a perspective on managing the portfolio of investments that's pretty evolved and, and very uh, very effective, it seems. I also think that they're very uh, economically driven. I think they do the math on these uh, investments that they make. Now, Airbnb is not uh, what you might call a startup anymore, but it is an early stage company in the spectrum of, you know, uh, companies that, uh, you know, decades long, uh, uh, um, that are usually that are big companies that are decades old. I think smaller companies. There's a company that I work with uh, right now um, called Signal Sciences, which uh, is 10 people um, in the uh, app security market. And Signal Sciences has a product uh, uh, about as wide open a funnel as you could imagine on the front end of the process. And the founders do sit at the center of that, and they listen to every idea, no matter how far off, wacky in line with the strategy, and then they call it, and then they have an honest conversation about why we're building what we're building. So it's a kind of a hybrid of like yep. wide open, chaotic market on the front end, but uh, benevolent dictatorship yeah. when it comes to writing the oh, stuff on the roadmap. In that case, probably benevolent, sometimes benevolent, sometimes not, it all depends, <laughs> yes. Um, so shifting, uh, there's kind of a, uh, a mainstream view now that uh, contrarian is being important, mm -hmm. right? So. It's, like, it's a very uh, common or a consensus view that contrarianism is important. 
Do you think contrarianism is important in the startup idea? If so, kind of how and more color, and if not, kind of why not? When is it critical to be contrarian? I don't think it's imperative. I do think it's a nice feature um, of a startup. Uh, I think it's it's certainly the place where you find value as an investor because, um, of course, it's the it's the wild enthusiasm of conventional wisdom that chases prices higher um, in those in those uh, in those investment rounds. I think the uh, so I, I appreciate contrarian thinking in a founder from that perspective. I think it also. I'd more like, I'd more enjoy the contrarian uh, uh, point of view because it, it helps me understand how the founder's brain works and his or her, his or her roadmap from uh, technical insight to the product idea that they have. If it's t totally surprising, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in there, and I, I like it more from, I like it more from what it tells me about the founder's brain, brain uh, thinking process. Yeah, I actually think that to get a massive discontinuous result, something it actually, ha in fact, actually usually has to be contrarian at least at the time of founding and going, because mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, we have a lot of different entrepreneurs, a lot of different efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual limiter factor is a lot of people competing for the same mm -hmm. capital, talent, market mm -hmm. space, customers, etc. On the other hand, I actually think part of where the whole contrarian theory goes too far is actually, in fact, you can have something that, you know, is maybe. Uh, specifically contrarian, like take Workday, mm. right, which said, okay, people didn't believe that going to the cloud was important, and so they made that key contrarian decision, but actually a next generation of high quality HR software, you said, well, this is much easier to use, much better, it has the benefit of, like it made one key contrarian decision, but everything else was just very good execution, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for because it's not contrarian to say have a much better UI, right. or it's not contrarian, you know, like those kinds of things, and so, yep. It's a nuance of it that I think is actually important. Um, okay, so shifting to some of the kind of uh, more, uh, what you'd think of is um, uh, kind of how we do startups questions. Um, how do you think people should think about evaluating themselves as founders? Hmm. Like when they think, am I a good founder or not? Should I do this or not? Hmm. Part of it is having the passion that you mentioned before. Right. Uh, but part of it is also other attributes. What are the things that you think people should consider in their self-evaluation? I think there's two separate uh, uh, answers to that. Let me do one which is really simple and one's a lot more complicated. The, fir the simple one is that the stages of life you will go through as a founder, first you have to have an insight, a technical insight. Second, you have to turn that insight into a product. And third, you have to hopefully, God willing, turn that product into a business. Those are mm -hmm. about as different Per sets of pursuits with almost with very little in common with each other. And so if you are energized by the idea of coming up with the technical insight and then moving to productization and then moving to the business building phase, that journey will be satisfying and exciting to you. Um, if, if you find yourself totally in love with the technical insight manufacturing process, that is a real problem. And then you end up having science projects, not companies. Um, if you find yourself endlessly prototyping and tinkering with the product without regard to the business economics, um, then that's a warning flag as well. I think you have to be energized in today's market where the expectation is that if you're onto something, you are move you're not just moving from these stages, you are screaming across uh, those stages. You have to be uh, willing in the earliest days to see yourself as, okay, we're, today we're in technical insight mode, in a month, we're going to be productizing. We're going to be worried about business economics shortly thereafter. And, I, and, and after we get to the other nuances of this, I'll actually add a few things. But uh, how do you find co-founders? How should you select co-founders? The, the advice I, I normally give people is take inventory of your own um, brain. Um, there's, a, there's a video on my website on harrisonmetal.com called The Cognitive Distortions of Founders. And um, this, this uh, is an inventory of the five most common uh, wacky ways of seeing the world that I've observed across thousands of founders that I've talked to over the last decade. The founders, if they have an idea that, say, I'll pick on one, which is a black and white thinker, somebody who's very judgmental about people and products, he or she has, they form very quick opinions and they're very strongly held. Um, the, uh, the black or white thinker oftentimes needs to be paired or shock absorbed by somebody who can point to the gray or the nuance or say, I like this thread of it, but what about this idea over here? So that the other people in the team don't get shut down by the visionary black and white thinker. 
Um, so I think of it like um, like pairing um, your uh, your 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 deadly risks with great shock absorbers, um, and and just acknowledging that you've got deadly risks that are the flip side of your great strengths is a huge step in the right direction. And then pairing the co-founder is probably the most powerful way to shock absorb. And ideally, you're even shock absorbing each other. Yep. And actually, since you mentioned that, one of our students' questions, and apologies if I get the name exactly right or wrong on the pronunciation, uh, Nahit Desai asked, as an investor, what kinds of cognitive sources of any do you look for in founders and how? Well, the, the ones that I really zoom in on uh, is first a sense of personal exceptionalism, um, a sense about themselves that, uh, you know, some countries have this about themselves. Um, uh, uh, this is a sense that you're not destined for an average outcome in life, that you're somehow operating outside the boundaries of normal for your peer group. Um, that sense of personal exceptionalism is a very, it comes in very handy uh, at, when you're founding a company. Um, this, the, the black and white thinking one is a real example. I think that's an important skill. It, for me, it proxies for the speed of decision making. I don't actually like black and white thinking because of the, the error rate can be high, but I do like the speed part of it, and speed is almost all you have in those days. Uh, another one is um, very related to Joseph Schumpeter, who we talked about earlier, sort of a Schumpeterian mindset, which is no matter the pain, the creative part of creative destruction is what gets me up in the morning, and so I am so excited about building the new thing that I will put myself and others through the, through the torture of the destruction. Um, there are a couple others. Um, uh, in that list, um, let's see, the... Um, go to the website. Okay, yeah, yes. yeah, go to the website. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and we'll post it, we'll get the link okay. and post it. Yeah, yep. <laughs> um, but the, uh, so one of the things I would add to what you said is, you've got to think about, in addition to the whole, like, you know, passion, product, kind of company as, a, as mm -hmm. an arc, you have to think a little bit about, do we have the key foundational skill sets that can actually tackle this market. It's anything from can we build the product to can we go to market yep. and how do we acquire those. The ones that are in the founding team have to be the, without this, we shouldn't even try this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Obviously, there'll be a lot of skills that you acquire through hiring. We're mm -hmm. going to get to that in a second. Uh, and so you have to think about that as, I think, as, as a kind of a cross check. And then I actually think that part of what you have to think about is um, part of the role of founders, different from people you're hiring, is, is being generalists. Mm -hmm. like tackling any problem that kind of comes along and that flexibility of it because there's just a laundry list of unexpected pivots you know and and um uh and challenges that you're not anticipating that one or more of the initial team is going to have to go kind of jump on and so one of the things that we think starts very heavily in this phase is generalists and you get to more hiring a specialist as you scale mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things that think about uh, adding to this it speaks back to what Michael was saying earlier about um, you go from a technology to a product to monetization. Yeah. If you really love the technology, you know, too bad you can't do it. It's like one of the things about good founders is you're drawn to the problems that nobody else in the team can solve. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you have to go if you need because nobody else can do that. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and so then let's talk also about the first few hires. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, how do you hire well? Like, you've, you've got ideally, ideal teams are two or three, sometimes it's solo, sometimes it's five. Two or three is usually the, 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 the ideal founding team. Now you make your first three hires, your first five hires. How do you advise you know, the various startups you work with what kind of hiring process to run, what to do, what not to do? Well, I get very worried when I see people come with a shopping list. And they're like saying, OK, I need uh, 32 ounces of front end uh, developer. <laughs> and uh, I need, uh, you know, I need a pound of iOS uh, back end. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work that way. And I think the early stage should be about surrounding yourself with people who are, uh, who, who share your passion, but who also will pick up and do anything. And of course, there's a checklist of things they have to be able to do. But, but I think of it like I look back at the successful early hiring experiences versus the unsuccessful ones, the shopping list, there's almost always a red flag on it, there's something going to be wrong here. Um, and, and, and the most successful hires, I think, in the early days come from your network or one degree separated from your network. Um, and that's because the passion has been transmitted in an organic way, not through a recruiter or a third party or an ad. I think that has its place, but it's much later in the cycle. Those first few, I think, you probably already know them. Yeah, and I actually agree with that. 
not just because of the signal, but also because of a bunch of other characteristics. Like, you know, are they going to go through the valley of the shadow of you? Because you're <laughs> almost always, are they actually, in fact, committed to, we are going to get this ship to port? Right. Um, are they, for example, things that are very difficult to measure, even in reference checking, which is obviously critically important. Is you know, I always prefer reference checking to, to interviewing if I had to pick one. Yep. But like questions of like, um, for example, how much of general learners are there? How much yep. generalists are there? How much can they pick up something new that you don't expect? Yes. Is all kind of, and you get all that much more through your network. Um, I, think, I also think that hmm. they, these conversations have to be focused on, tell me about a time when you fill in the blank. Tell yeah. me about a time when you faced like a horrible disappointment. Tell me about a time that you consider your greatest victory. Tell me about a time when you realized you were different. You know, go back and talk to people about their lives. Um, that will give you a flavor. People repeat the same strengths and weaknesses over and over again. And all you have to do is ask for a few stories, and you'll get a very good view into uh, who, who they actually are. Yep, like solving key problems. Solve a key problem. What did you decide to do with your free time? When you had your summers to yourself or when you had a, an open space in your course calendar or you had uh, three months to go do whatever you wanted between gigs, what did you do yep. when you had pure, perfect freedom? And by the way, the students are probably having a little bit of deja vu, some, some questions like this were on our application process. Oh, is that class. right? Oh, yes. good, 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 good. <laughs> right. And there's a reason for that, by the way, which yeah. you, were, you were revealing. So when you're, uh, so now you got your founders together, you may have hired a few people, you're going, what are the first things that you focus on? Well, it goes back to that McCallum list. I can't yeah. tell you. I mean, that is, I walk around with that thing. It comes up every single day for me with, with founders is, you know, who's working on what? Is that the most important mm -hmm. stuff? Uh, do they have the authority to like keep moving ahead or are they blocked by something? How do we know how it's going along the way? You'd be amazed how many 10 person companies get surprised at the end of a, of a release or a rollout or a month with like, oh, well, that didn't work. Well, how can that be? There's only, we're sitting right here. Like, how can we, you know, so the, those McCallum questions, the, you know, that he was really trying to say, look, running the 50 mile road is a joy and easy compared to this nightmare that I'm in. Uh, here's the things that I, I know are the fundamental duties of a leader. And, and, and that's, I think, just as true today in, in startups as it was for McCallum. Is there a question you would add to McCallum's list if you were to have a seventh? For early stage ventures, I probably would go back to the question about financial viability. Um, you know, uh, are, are we sure that we're building a business? Um, and unfortunately, in the current funding environment, um, many things are being backed with venture capital that are not, in fact, going to be businesses. They're either public goods, science projects, or um, hobbies, um, but they're not businesses. And so I think that's a discipline that I would like, I would add to the McCallum list. Uh, hobbies is a very gentle word. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what is the importance and when of having your go-to-market and distribution strategy? I think that you have to have a hypothesis mm -hmm. of it. And I, 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 I know that it's, it's very unfashionable to have, um, a, you know, the, the idea of a full detailed plan on founding day is, is, is not, that's not what's going to happen. But I do like to know how the founders think about that, um, how founders think about that, because it helps me understand how their brain works. Mm -hmm. So I think of it like an opinionated person who has the guts to found a company ought to have some hypothesis about how it might go to market. Uh, and do you think, uh, would your decision to invest ever gate on that? Yes, because if it doesn't exist, uh, it's a laziness of mind and um, uh, and a, a, a red flag. Now, I think the um, I think there's you have to distinguish: is there a prototype answer to that question versus how close to awesome is that prototype answer? It doesn't need to be close to awesome because we're going to like have many many cycles to figure that out. But there has to be a prototype. You can't you can't convince a stranger to give you money. Uh, you shouldn't be able to convince a stranger to give you money if you haven't said, and here, by the way, is how we will go to market. You could be completely wrong, but you can't withhold that uh, view into your brain. It's like saying, you know, I don't have a prototype yet of the actual software. You'd never, you'd never say that, right? So, and then I'm going to give you a, a, a brief list of things that are my suggestions, but you can mod them and comment. I want you to actually specifically comment on them. What are the things you can ignore? What are the things that you go mm. at the early stage, don't pay any attention to this, or do minimally, or do intensively? 
a board of directors, hiring executives, knowledge about advertising campaigns, brand, planning your brand, a plan for scaling customer service, detailed analytic dashboards. These things so far, these are all on the list of things that you think we can yeah. safely ignore? Mostly. Not always. There's always specifics. But. I, I, I just would like, I would, I would say every founder should have his or her own, his or her own list of things they plan to ignore. Uh, and they should also know that if I'm going to ignore board of directors, I need to have a governance approach. I need to make sure that um, somebody is, you know, looking at this who isn't just me, um, who can critique the strategy. It might be an advisor. It might be a trusted colleague. It might be a, a co-founder who has the... Uh, Remember, we're talking about five to 15 people kind of in the company. This is this is this space. Well, and, and the reason I'm zooming in on board is because mm. most of the companies I fund are that size and I always put a board on, and I'm yeah. always on it. Yep. Uh, so I think they serve a really good, I think they serve a really good mm -hmm. and valuable function. And if you're going to do without one of these things, you should just have a, 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 a hypothesis or a shock absorber in its place to do that, to do that function. Um, one of the things I wish was on your list, and maybe it is further mm -hmm. down, is frickin' PR. Um, and you know the idea that founders are brands and that companies need to have high profile and be written about by whomever, it's a lie. It's a complete and total lie, and it's manufactured by the people who sell ads for page views uh, to convince you that you need to talk to them. Uh, and it's a complete and total lie. You may decide for your own reasons to go do PR for your company, but it doesn't actually change the outcome. In fact, it, uh, many, many times it can actually skew, tip the outcome in the wrong direction. And recruiting is a perfect example of this. If you are getting, if you're deciding to do PR because of recruiting, the people you will attract are the wrong people because most of your life as a company will be spent not being written about in a flattering way. Um, and so if that's what they need to be motivated, they're going to be very disappointed. And by the way, as a pointer here in that first class, we mentioned that one of the things you will see as we go through each of these stages between these very smart people doing this is some things will be reiterated. They're kind of surprising. And those are things to actually pay attention to. And some things will also be disagreed, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. This was one of the points that Sam was making, Sam mm. Altman was making in the last class. Mm. Right? It is actually, in fact, is a reiteration point. And that was part of the reason to mm. kind of point out what the, the patterns of, of surprising similarity would be. On the board of directors, um, what I was actually, what I more mean, because actually, in fact, if you find a financial kind of partner, co-investor, you should actually get someone who is, who is maximally adding value. Mm -hmm. The normal position is for them to partner with you by board of directors. So I actually agree with you, just to be clear there. Yep. However, sometimes I see uh, uh, founders going, okay, how do I build out my board? Right. Like, how do I have independence now, right. et cetera? At the five to 15 people, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. It wasn't the other way around there. It's like, why do you need a board at five to 15? Just build products, like, ignore the board. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about what you mean and what, it's not fiduciary guidance, really. Is that right? It's something else you're, you're getting at? I think it's the healthy, uh, ex the healthy accountability to the market, which uh, you have to remember, if you've got no customers and you've got no product, you're not, but you've got a pile of money uh, provided by those awesome institutions, uh, you know, you've got a, a civic, it's a citizenship duty, right? Like to, to actually sit down and say like, okay, here's where we're going to spend it. Here's, here's how long it's going to last us. Uh, is there anything we should be doing differently, in your opinion? You can get that a lot of ways. I like it with a board um, just because I think it gives people, a, in the seed stage, it gives them a dress rehearsal for what it's going to be like when they are dealing with, you know, handful uh, Sand Hill Road people, uh, you know. Uh, I don't really like to be identified as a Sand Hill Road person, but that's okay. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's fine. It's I try. Fine. I live in denial. Well, yeah. you get to you get to name yourself, Reed. Um, <laughs> I try. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think of it like a dress rehearsal for for varsity uh, level company yep. management. Well, since we're on this part of financing, um, how what recommendation do you give? You know, just founding teams, first, few, you know, the fo the founders, the first couple people in terms of how to think about financing. What are the, the key do's and don'ts? And obviously the backdrop is everyone's reflex is simply go for the highest valuation and the highest amount of money because that looks like a scorecard. Well, and it's even worse than that because the, 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 the conventional wisdom today says punt totally on valuation and use uh, debt, uh, use convertible debt or even worse, some something called a, a simple agreement for future equity. Um, 
you know, which God knows what that is. Uh, you know, I, you know, I think uh, Schumpeter is, probably wouldn't have. No, oh, yes. no. Listen, nobody came to this country because they wanted to be have great convertible debt terms. Uh, uh, people, people thrive in this environment because they want ownership. They want to add value to their ownership, and then they want to sell their ownership later for more. And um, and along the way, they're going to create hopefully a fortune that will do good things for the world. We kind of can't help ourselves when we make a fortune. As a species, we do good things with the money. Um, uh, even the worst people you can imagine, when they're drop dead, that money is going to go to really good use. Uh, so, so <laughs> I think this is an ownership economy, and I like to be part of an ownership economy. I encourage founders, treat yourself to real shareholders. Real shareholders, people who rise and sink with you, people who do not have uh, particularly special downside protection, people who do not have a lender's claim on your assets. This is all nonsense created by... Uh, the legal profession and 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 some um, I don't even know what to call them uh, hucksters who want to explode the size of the venture Carpet capital baggers, business. Carpetbaggers. the earlier description. Something. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a uh, it's it's a terrible miss. It's a terrible disservice to teach founders that they don't deserve shareholders who rise and fall with them, who don't sink and swim with them, who aren't tied to the mast with them. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is you do not get that when you sell convertible debt or when you have highly distributed uh, financings from people who, who for you, uh, you know, it's like a generous tip that they gave you. Uh, it's not even really uh, skin in the game. So treat yourself to shareholders. Um, uh, uh, have the hard conversation about valuation. Uh, it's perfectly okay to disagree with somebody about the valuation of your company. By the way, the math to do a valuation on an early stage company is really simple. How big a check do you want to write divided by what ownership percentage do you want to have? If you can do that, and I know you all can because I could do it in fifth grade, uh, you can value a company. That's all it is. So, so ignore the advice you're getting from lawyers or whomever to do convertible debt with no valuation. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible poison in our industry right now. Do you think the same thing about convertible notes with caps? Yes, even worse. They're disguised as uh, it's... it's, it's, uh, it, it's um, it's 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 uh, what's the it's a uh, lipstick on a pig. Is that the right uh, thing? <laughs> that um, is an idiom. <laughs> it's still not ownership. It is a it is a and and by the way, that cap is never the today value of the company. And so what you're asking the investor to do, and you would never do this because you're smart. You're in the front row of this class. Uh, <laughs> you would you would never you would never take the deal where I said okay. I'm going to uh, ask you to help me on a bunch of stuff, and then I'm going to give you shares valued at the price after you're done helping me. That's a terrible deal. Why should you pay for value that you helped create? Why should you not benefit from the upside that you get uh, from taking that venture risk at the beginning of the venture? You should get a price that reflects the value today, not the hypothetical value 12 months down the road. Yeah, I mean, the key... Does that make sense? Uh, and actually, no? I will take these questions in a second because this is an important issue. The key way to, um, to look at this is if you are actually selecting a good partner in building this business, you want someone who's motivated by trying to magnify the value of your business as much as possible. So you want to give them actually a stake at where your valuation is, and then you come to kind of an agreement. And actually, there's a good process. It's one of the few things in entrepreneurship is zero sum. It's what percentage mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a zero sum negotiation. But the way you navigate that zero sum uh, conversation is actually, in fact, very helpful for understanding how good partners you're going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. It's a good test on both sides because it's a difficult thing to navigate. But once you navigate that, you've, you've solved that problem. And then you've given your partner an incentive to how do you grow the business as much as possible. And so that's the reason why uncapped convertible notes are a terrible idea, right? Like just horrible. And almost never do them uh, personally other than like de minimis checks to say, sure, fine. It doesn't really mean anything, cetera, but I almost never do them. Right. Capped is still a problem because you should do exactly what, what Michael's talking about. Sometimes capped is a hack that, you know, that, that is more acceptable for that reason. Now, we had two questions. One was here on this. Yeah. So um, as a founder, if you're trying to raise money and you have options to take money from, like in the form of a convertible note with a cap or without cap, um, I, I think part of my understanding of your criticism is that it seems like an unfair deal um, on the financier side because you're helping grow the valuation of the company without um, getting a piece of that. But as a founder, if you're raising in a competitive fundraising environment, like right now, where it's much easier to raise money than historically in a lot of cases, um, 
if you still think that you're going to be getting um, like the valuable benefits of a partnership, and um, because of the competitive nature of VC right now, some are willing to give you like a cap convertible note that inflates your valuation. Mm -hmm. How much of that is important versus like the you know working with a partner um, who will provide benefits beyond money? And obviously, you know, from your perspective as people who are providing, we're, we're teachers in this context, not venture capitalists. Well, and the other <laughs> thing we are is we ju we vote with our dollars, right? And so if 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 an investor is willing to do that deal that you said, a capped convertible note, and she or, and she or he is is saying, I will help you just the same as I would with straight up equity, um, you have to just ask yourself if you believe it. Um, and my, you know, uh, I'd say, well, I'd say about 60% of the meetings I have on a weekly basis with founders are people I don't even have a business relationship with. They're just people who say like, hey, can we talk? Because I need help. And uh, the, 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 um, the number of those founders who are showing me polluted cap tables with useless yeah. investors who do nothing, uh, who promised the world, who said, oh, I'm gonna, my Rolodex is your Rolodex, you're in trouble, call me. The phone's ringing, the shit's hitting the fan, nobody's picking up. That doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen when somebody is going to lose uh, a lot of money and a lot of ownership in the business. It just doesn't. I think that you have to ask yourself, is equity, the idea of equity was invented after thousands of years of people trading with each other and learning how the human operating system works. And there's a reason why... Uh, some people like to be owners. It's so they can help and they can make it worth more money. Not because they're altruistic, but because they are highly motivated to put points on the board financially. And so to, to ask that, to believe that the human operating system isn't what we for thousands of years sort of have seemed, it seems like it is, um, is really a stretch. And I'm seeing lots of founders who are just they're looking at their list of 30, 40 investors, each of whom have put 25 or 50 or $100,000 in, and they just can't get any help uh, because it was a lie from the beginning. The, so. the two amplifications I would do is one is at every single financing we did in LinkedIn, we did not actually take the maximum value. We actually, in fact, made choices based on who we were partnering with uh, in terms of, of the offer because it was very much on partner. And then the second thing is, um, uh, uh, I personally and, and a bunch of investors have passed on deals because the cap table is too screwed up. Yeah. Because that means that that's likely to screw up the company on the road because we're investing at a five to 10 year horizon. And so we're looking at patterns that actually in fact will trip you up. And that's actually in fact a serious problem. Uh, so on this topic, uh, there was another question back here. But it's like anything else, you should reference. Like there's some people oh, yeah. that are yeah. outliers that are yeah. clear values. Yes. Yeah. And you learn them on any cap table. Yes. And so you should reference. Yes, for sure. So the discussion of basically uh, delay evaluation. I'll remember you. So the discussion of delay evaluation versus um, a price round is it's been a hot debate for many years. Um, but I guess the advent of the safe sheet has really started to bring these issues up again. The other sheet that people tend to use are the Benwick series seed docs. Yes. It's more of the middle road. Would you advocate for that? That's exclusively what I use in my business. Awesome. Which exclusively. Just, just in case it didn't get on the microphone, is the Fenwick series. Series C, yeah, seriesseed.com is a yeah. set of open source, and it's also on GitHub, a series of open source equity financing documents created by Ted Wang at Fenwick and West. Um, and it's the only template I use. Jason Bay makes put them on GitHub, so they're pretty confident. Yeah. Um, cool. But who's the partner, when you guys are starting out, uh, or who's the firm that picked up the phone with us? Mm. Good question. What do you mean by that? When, uh, I'm not sure if it ever hit the fan, uh, but if, when it did, who picked up your phone? Uh, well, so uh, part of the reason, so I um, did my Series A uh, with Mark Kwame, who was then at Sequoia, uh, and then Series B with David Z, who's at Greylock, and I put in a number of angels into the Series A as well because part of the thing is a network distribution. And basically, uh, nobody got into that round at all unless they were actually, in fact, active at either one. And, and both, like all of the top tier funds, all of them have an active participation model. There isn't a top tier fund that doesn't have an active participation model because that's the thing that actually helps build truly, truly uh, great companies. Um, and so, uh, but like for example, like one of our mutual friends is a guy named Josh Koppelman at First Round Capital. He was an angel investor in, in LinkedIn and he helped, mm -hmm. right? And that was before actually I think he'd done First Round Capital and, mm -hmm. and that's really, and those are the kinds of things. But, but that's actually when you're actually asking for 
like you should reference check as John says, but when you're actually asking people to participate, you should have an explicit conversation about what the what this alliance looks like. Like what is the thing that we are doing together and what is what should I expect and, and how should it be? And the person should be straight up and you should call them if they're not being if they're not being if they're not holding to what they agreed to. Mm -hmm. There was another question back here. Yeah, I want to understand better uh, why you dislike the safe documents compared to the C documents. They get rid of the convertible debt, which I think is great uh, to get rid of that. In a, in a so, so why a more elaboration on why the safe documents are? Well, I'm deeply suspicious of anything that's acronym is designed to make you trust it. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the the, pa the Patriot Act comes to my mind. Uh, uh, I also I also don't know what problem it's solving. Uh, I'm 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 watching a uh, a very well developed ad advanced system in capitalism where I give you money in exchange for a small piece of ownership in your company. It's not a complicated idea. The math behind it is totally simple. The safe works the same way. Uh, I'm talking about a cat safe, of course. But I I'm not a shareholder. Uh, but you wouldn't either in a Series C would you be. Heck yeah. yeah. I no, have those, those freaking certificates uh, yeah. framed behind my desk. Uh, I, uh, the, 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 uh, the ownership point, it's, 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 it's look, at, uh, look at the difference between renters and owners and how they treat their homes. Look at the difference between uh, rent controlled uh, 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 situations and ownership societies. Uh, ownership uh, mechanisms uh, ensure the best long term custodianship of those assets. And uh, we may not like some of the complexity that goes with that, like the difficult conversation around, well, how much are you worth today? Oh, I'm not yelling at you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what I'm saying. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a choice. But also, the safes don't fix the price. Safes work just like the vertical the pricing. Right. They're just not debt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't know what is that, the, what is that then. So it's like some very last of... question for this session. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, it's not in the uh, best interest to do a uh, highly distributed deal, and also that you want to have ownership, uh, a state that gives you ownership. From the investor standpoint, what is uh, the ideal situation, let's say for Suze, um, how would you like it to be in terms of, you know, not being something that's really oversubscribed? Mm. Well, that's a, I was going to say that's a read question. <laughs> so, look, I think your ideal circumstance is uh, you actually end up with two components. One component is a lead investor who is literally getting into the foxhole with you, who is going to be with you through, because you're going to have difficult times, especially from this, you know, essentially the family side startup. You're going to have, you're going to have multiple times looking forward in the future where you're like, why did we ever think this was a good idea? Why did we ever think it was going to succeed? You want someone who's going to work th through those problems with you. And your lead is really important. The lead is also important as having a good partnership with you, being able to help you navigate some of the challenges, uh, being able to help you do your next round of financing, because that's usually the key is the lead, is the person who's going to help do that. And you have to think about not just the upside circumstances, but the down circumstances. Mm -hmm. You have to think, I might be hitting it out of the park, I might be doing okay, and I might be in trouble. And I want a good partner in all of these circumstances. They might be particularly good at one of them, but they're going to be good at all of them. Then, ideally, now, and then the question is, what's the percentage that motivates them? Most funds, that's 20 to 30 percent, right? There are circumstances where they can trade below that, but those circumstances are usually like, I come and my product's already launched, I got massive traction, okay, I can be motivated at a lower percentage because I know I'm already at a, at a higher risk thing. I've got an idea, it's the back of a napkin, it's like, look, if I'm going to put the work into this with you and I'm going to allocate the time and try to make it happen, what's the appropriate percentage? And usually a way of looking at that is kind of it's like a financial co-founder you know, to your percentage. It's like I'm partnering with you doing this. But then you also want to get some people in the network in terms of like, uh, who are key other like you know, angel investors, key people who could help with the business, bring customers, bring talent, bring advice, solve key problems. It's a data business. Do you have a great data person who might be an angel investor who could help with that? And it's specific to the business. And your ideal configuration is that lead plus a select few of highly valuable people that you can essentially partner with. And that's your ideal circumstance. So there were a, a set of very uh, good questions in the LinkedIn group. We will give some props to you. We actually noticed them. I actually have them all printed up here as we are doing it. And so thank you for them. But I actually thought the financing thing is so critical 
during the family one that I actually, in fact, it was worth actually going into yeah. depth on that. And that's part of the reason why I diverted to that. And if it's helpful, I'm happy to maybe write up some of the answers yeah. to the well, other questions. Yeah, as I sent them to you. Okay. And so with this, thank Michael for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah.